Oh, okay. Good afternoon or good morning to all our panelists and viewers out there wherever you are. You are tuned in to the Bucharest Forum session entitled Security of Infrastructures, What Role for International Cooperation? My name is Brooks Tigner. I'm the EU and NATO Affairs <coughs> Correspondent for James Defense Weekly here in Brussels. And I'll be your moderator for the next 45 seconds, or 45 minutes, excuse me. Um, and I want to thank our organizers uh, for putting this on. Um, this is a pleasure to, to moderate this topic, which I covered also for many years for my newsletter, Security Europe, Homeland Security. So um, critical infrastructure, uh, it's a good topic. Uh, it's obviously a primary target of cyber and hybrid warfare attacks. Uh, big question, of course, is how to protect it. That's the purpose of our debate today. Uh, this is already very difficult to do at national level for many countries, and it becomes very complex uh, when it has to be done on an international level. For instance, it took the EU many, many years to get its NIS, its Network and Information Security Directive, in place, and more years to compel telco operators to actually com comply with it. And that's just one sector. I mean, we've got, you can easily think of energy, transport, the usual ones, space sector, very important uh, critical infrastructure uh, network, which we all depend on for today. And the more obvious, the, the less obvious ones, such as seabed cables, uh, which bring the internet across the globe to us all. So the big question, can the international community really come together to protect these assets? And if so, how? I'm a bit scared, if I have to admit, but we're here to discuss this issue from different aspects and with our four policy and operational experts that we have on the panel today. Let me briefly introduce them. We have Stephen Flanagan, who is Senior Political Scientist with the RAND Corporation. Thank you, Steve, and welcome. Next, Jamie Shea, who's Jamie Shea, who is a former Deputy Assistant Secretary General for NATO's Emerging Security Challenges. That was precisely the policy division that has dealt with and continues to deal with critical infrastructure issues, among other things. And he's now a professor who splits his time between the UK uh, and as a think tank analyst here in Brussels. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you. Thank we you. Had, next, we have General Dominique Trancon, who is former head of the French military mission to the UN and currently director of external relations at the French company known as Group Marc in Paris. Welcome, Dominique. And finally, Richard Spearman, who is Group Corporate Security Director at the UK's Vodafone Group, which is one of the world's major telco players. Welcome to you too. So now, uh, with no further waste of time, because we only have a, a relatively short period to debate these issues, let's move on to our discussion. I'm going to give each speaker about five minutes to make their opening remarks and statements, and then we'll move quickly to Q&A. And I do want to encourage all of our viewers out there to send in your questions. Otherwise, you'll have to listen to mine. And I have lots of questions. And if you don't want to hear a journalist's questions, type your question and send it in. And with no further ado, Stephen, I give you the digital floor. You have five minutes. Great. Thank you very much, Brooks. And it's a pleasure to join you all this morning. I guess you could say we're starting from the heavens and coming back to Earth. My comments are going to concern risks to outer space resilience, as you mentioned, uh, and the role in particular of norms and how the norms could, and international cooperation could help uh, mitigate some of these challenges. So my remarks will concern um, uh, the, the potential disruption, first of all, uh, and how international cooperation could help uh, avoid some of the growing uh, potential uh, disruption, both inadvertent and intentional on uh, space, critical space infrastructure. Uh, my comments will draw on a, a, a proceedings of three recent virtual transatlantic and transpacific workshops that we held at RAND on what was called responsible space behavior. Uh, these took place in September, and the proceedings are, are still pending publication, but will be available uh, in more detail. Of course, because of global dependence on space, it's in everyone's interest to advance norms of responsible behavior uh, to enhance global space governance. So this year we initiated uh, these workshops, keying off several uh, key hypotheses. First of all, the discussion of uh, a global space governance, um, which has really spanned the entire era of spaceflight, uh, 
but has uh, been largely stagnant for the last two decades, with some exceptions. Of course, recent efforts, including the uh, EU effort to uh, uh, develop an international code of conduct uh, that somewhat uh, uh, came apart in uh, 2015. Second, yeah. uh, due to the explosion of space operations and space operators, uh, you know, a growing com and very lively commercial sector with very complex constellations, uh, economic and social vulnerabilities to space hazard, in particular space debris, are growing. Uh, several governments, of course, particularly Russia and China, are also developing extensive counter space systems. Uh, and India's destructive debris generating anti satellite weapon test last year was also another reminder of some of the risks. Thirdly, given the extensive global dependence on space, we, we feel uh, that it really is in everyone's interest to uh, begin to come to at least some general agreement on norms of responsible behavior uh, to enhance uh, global space governance. The power to conceive and design space norms as a, as a global space uh, governance system is, is no longer the purview, however, of just a small number of great, great space powers and their national security arms. It also must include leaders from all the space sectors uh, to include uh, international players of, at all levels, including the commercial sector, other civil players. So it's a, it's a much more complicated game today. And indeed, uh, some in the commercial sector are moving out on their own, uh, particularly those that are in, uh, putting in orbit these very large constellations, uh, some uh, sort of rules of the road and, and mechanisms to help ensure that they don't have um, what the space community calls uh, conjunctions, or what we would call in normal English con con uh, con uh, uh, collisions uh, that would uh, generate lots of space debris that would be hazardous to other space uh, right. objects. So we convened these workshops that I mentioned, and we asked sort of participants, which included a large number of, uh, of officials, uh, former officials, experts, uh, representatives of the commercial community, others, what are the problems that need to be, what are the problems we're trying to solve? Why haven't we solved them before? And where should we go from here? And while we're still analyzing these insights, uh, I think I can offer some uh, preliminary views on, on where we think the way ahead lies and, and why international cooperation can be uh, helpful. Uh, overall, participants agree that the, uh, the complexity and, and, the, and the scope of the problems are definitely growing, again, because of this growing uh, uh, number of space operators and space objects that are out there. Uh, we group them into sort of several, uh, several key areas, uh, debris, space traffic management, operations, safety, security, and stability. These are very, there are very diverse views on, on how uh, among you know, some of the space experts that we've consulted over how to uh, uh, best address these. Um, and of course, uh, the, the uh, most importantly, uh, the growing risk of orbital debris and the history of various failed efforts. But uh, before we even asked the, the second question about where do we go from here, there was clearly a diversity of perspectives about um, uh, the, uh, uh, there's no common view on the issues of norms, let alone the concepts of global space governance. Um, you know, issues of lack of awareness, what, we, what they call in, the, in that uh, specialty, space situational awareness, uh, lack of common interests, and various other barriers. So the historic record demonstrates that the lack of progress over the past three years has, uh, has been complicated by all of those factors. So this led us to a final question, where do we go from here? So we've come to the conclusion that really the first thing, and, and a number of our experts that we consulted, first of all, we have to prioritize support for the norms that do exist, uh, particularly some that even exist in the existing Outer Space Treaty. And in particular, that treaty calls upon parties, and I quote, to conduct all their activities in outer space with due regard to corresponding interest of all other states' parties to the treaty. So that would be something that would suggest that creating a, a, a doing a, a debris generating uh, anti satellite test as uh, as the Indians did last year, as the Chinese did in 2007, uh, that that would be a, an example of, of behavior that is outside even the existing norms. Then also we thought uh, we've uh, sort of leaning to the notion that it really and uh, we need to look at some first steps, sort of walk uh, walk run uh, crawl one run walk. Uh, begin with some achievable steps, some bilateral agreements among like-minded states to look for ways to, grill, uh, to build greater buy-in through incentives. And this was, this was really the, uh, uh, the, what animated the previous EU-led efforts at an co international code of conduct. 
And some examples of areas that could be first steps could include greater transparency about space operations, uh, sharing data on space situ situational awareness, and a ban on debris causing ASAP tests. So Steve, I'm going to have to. Said, sure, I'm. Steve, I'm going to have to intervene here. You're, you're going to have to bring it, bring it to a uh, halt very quickly. I have okay. one more word to say. Okay. I have one more word to say. Uh, we're uh, looking towards uh, further research to uh, uh, enhance uh, space resilience and security. Looking to the UN and other international uh, fora for uh, the opportunities to move forward. So thank you. Okay, good. I want to come back to that last point and, and two of the others that you said, but we'll do that later. Okay. Ooh, that's a very dense overview, and you raised a lot of different issues there. Uh, food for many questions, actually. Um, let's move on to our second um, speaker, to Jamie Shea. Uh, Jamie, you have the floor. Uh, Brooks, thanks very much. Uh, good to see uh, dear old friends and, and colleagues still clearly alive and kicking, if only on the screen. And thank you for, to the Bucharest Forum for the invitation today. Um, first point is, of course, critical infrastructure is now much more, much broader. The concept is much wider than what we maybe thought just a couple of years ago. We have the physical infrastructure. Brooks, you referred to that in your introduction, uh, the pipelines, the electricity grids, the telecommunications infrastructure, which, of course, is vulnerable to, to sabotage or hacking, as we saw with the attack on Ukrainian the Ukrainian energy uh, grid a few years ago. But we're also now uh, aware that there is political infrastructure, the functionality of our democratic systems in the wake of the interference in the election campaigns and the possibility of manipulating uh, uh, voting or data collection. And finally, we know that there is something called some infrastructure in other words, the perception of the truth and reality that our citizens have. Um, and of course, if that perception is a, a clear a variance with uh, governments, then uh, governing societies, uh, trust in leadership, uh, trust in the truth becomes much more difficult. So we can no longer just see the problem as a physical one. We have to be able to operate in all three areas. Second thing, of course, is that there are both short-term challenges. What do you do if uh, there is an attack and how do you know if you're being attacked? and who is behind it, uh, and therefore rapid response, uh, trying to uh, 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 limit the damage and recover as quickly as possible, what we now call uh, resilience. But then there is the more long-term challenge of ensuring you don't maneuver yourself into a situation of dependency on somebody else's supply chain, somebody else's medicine, somebody else's personal protective uh, e equipment um, um, uh, in, a, in a crisis situation, um, and, and therefore make yourself liable to blackmail or, or simply being denied access to, 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 to what you need. And, and basically, I think that at the strategic level, there are two sort of key challenges here. Number one is how do we close the gap between the threat, which we know is quite considerable, and of course, here I'm talking about the man-made threats, because we could spend many happy hours talking about the resilience of critical infrastructure uh, to the permafrost melting in Siberia, or forest fires, or uh, the extreme weather events that we now associate change, but I imagine for this session we're probably focusing more on the state level, actor level, man-made type of threat. So how do we close the gap between the threat and our level of preparation and responsiveness? And number two, uh, in what we now call hybrid warfare, the grey zone, how do we sort of get inside the calculus of our adversaries so that we know what kind of reactions best influence uh, their decision whether to attack us or not, and how do we persuade them over time that the effort simply isn't uh, uh, worth it. Now, I, I would think that probably we need to look at five key areas, and as there are only five minutes, and I'm probably already down to three and a half, I'm going to have to go pretty quickly here. But I think the first thing is we have to look more closely at the relationship with the private sector, which, of course, is increasingly responsible for the innovation, the R&D, um, the rollout of the technology, and the ownership of the technology. And, um, and although there's been a lot said and written about this, I still think there's a lot to do. For example, there is a cultural gap. A couple of years ago, I was at a meeting in Lloyd's of London, uh, the big uh, shipping insurers, uh, talking about piracy. And, uh, and from the NATO perspective, we were sort of talking about all of the things that we were doing with maritime forces to capture pirates. But uh, they, they were uh, you know, very, very sort of sanguine about all of this because at the end of the day, they explained to us that from their perspective, the risk was entirely manageable. Uh, and if one of their ships was taken uh, 
capt captured by the pirates, they would simply be prepared to pay the ransom and, and get the money back from the insurance. So that was just a, an anecdote to show that sometimes the perception of threat, perception of risk between government and the private sector can be very difficult. We need to uh, narrow that gap. I think the second thing is we can't just expect to have good cooperation with the private sector if we phone them up when there's a crisis. We have to involve them much earlier and much more into the policy discussion. We have to ensure there's a regulatory environment which is not bureaucratic, which is open, particularly in terms of the exchange of information, um, so that we can encourage them to share information uh, with us. Um, and I often hear when I speak to the private sector that governments are always saying what they want the private sector to give them. Think of the NIST directive, the Network Information Security Directive from the European Union. But the governments are not so willing to say what they in exchange will give to the private sector uh, yeah. in terms of intelligence or assistance uh, to incentivize that type of uh, cooperation. So we need to see if business to cope with the shocks, how we can induce business to take this uh, more seriously as well, and what is the, the light touch regulatory framework. The second thing, and you, Brooks, you mentioned the international level, is, is that I think that both NATO and the EU still have some work to do to define their precise role in terms of the emergency response. The EU is very good at, in Steve's area, which is the norm setting, the regulatory environment. You know, we think of the general uh, regulation of data protection and so on. I mentioned in directive, but it's not so clear what the EU would do to step up to the plate to assist its member states in dealing with major shocks. We've seen, for example, during COVID-19 that, that initially the EU had no role to play, that this was still a national responsibility. Uh, there are some interesting initiatives afoot. For example, the Lithuanians have got a project within the permanent structured cooperation to see how cyber response teams could be better distributed around the EU to help member states, looking at trusted suppliers, uh, all of these kind of things. For those of us like you, Brooks, who live in Brussels, uh, we are familiar with articles like 42.7 of the EU Lisbon Treaty, which provides for more solidarity and more mutual assistance uh, in dealing with sort of you know non-military uh, 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 threats. That's the preserve of NATO. It's only been invoked once, as you know, Brooke, in the aftermath of the terrorist attacks against France. But clearly, there's a good deal of scope in seeing not just how the EU can set norms, but how the EU can actually provide detailed assistance. In the NATO area, I think there's a lot of work to be done on the toolbox. In other words, what kind of responses can you roll out which would really deter and be an appropriate sort of reaction uh, against the hybrid threats and attacks on critical infrastructure? It, it's a work in progress in knowing, you know, if sanctions work better than naming and shaming, if freezing the assets of oligarchs uh, work uh, uh, better, for instance, than counter cyber attacks or whatever. But we need to look far more at this. Uh, at the attribution issue, how can we be certain faster? But also just clarifying the situation, Brooks. I, I'm amazed that even today, with all of our intelligence resources, we, we still can't figure out one week after Azerbaijan and Armenia have been firing at each other, who fired first, whether Syrian foreign fighters are really on the ground, and, and what is exactly happening. Um, so I think NATO can work a lot in, in these particular areas uh, as well, what we call deterrence below the Article 5. Very quickly, right. Brooks, I think also a lot to be done in terms of police cooperation. That we we look a lot uh, in the international domain at how militaries uh, and security establishment can work together, but I think there is still a largely unexplored area of police and homeland uh, law enforcement uh, working together because many of these uh, uh, things that we're looking at are, are not major and not military and are very much in that domain. Uh, I think also Jenny, we need Jenny, to bring it to a close on that, okay? I'm sorry. I'll, I'll bring it to a close on that. I would have mentioned, Brooke, simply the whole of society resilience concept and finally technological sovereignty, how we control our technology, uh, but we can take that up in the discussion. Thank you. Okay, doc. great. Thank you very much. Uh, yep, two two issues I'll come back to on, on that, particularly on over at NATO and the, the CivMil uh, coordination. Uh, that's big a big tub of issues there that I don't think is moving ahead the way it should, but we can discuss that later. Uh, I do want to move on to our third speaker, uh, to Dominique Trancon. Um, You've, I've let it, people have spoke about six minutes, so I'm going to ask you to try and stick to that as well. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think I, I will start from where you, you end with the, the NATO and the good old time when before the 90s, NATO was planning uh, 
the defense and protection of uh, critical infrastructure. And I will go back to, to basics. Since that time, things have changed a lot. It has been discussed about airspace, cyber and all that, but I will go back to basic, which is airport, uh, arbor, uh, roads, bridge, things yep. like, like that. Uh, since uh, the last 30 years, we have increased Western Europe with a lot of countries who are more east than we were. And all the plans prior to the 90s were really focused on the UK and the Western Europe. Now we, we need to take care of the all, all, the, all Europe. And in fact, I, I understand that uh, EU is taking care of that for the last, in coordination with NATO, of course, uh, for the last uh, two or three years, because we we need to take into account the big differences that we've got in the eastern part of the Euro Europe, in the western part of Europe, and what do we need really to protect, which is not really to have a armored a division going from west to east or east to west, but to have the, the normal flow of uh, of uh, the economy working and we've seen with the last crisis of COVID, we've seen that for example without aircraft we had a big problem in in uh, having our economy running at the same pace so my point is that as uh, shemi has just shown is that a lot of the things are in private hands and it's more and more difficult for this company to understand that they no longer have uh, something like NATO planning and asking them to do things, but uh, they have to coordinate between themselves. And we, we have to put them in front of their obligation uh, concerning our citizen and our economy. And so the organization between national, international, say EU or NATO and private is of major importance. And uh, to understand that Making money is fine in peacetime, but you need to prepare to go in a different environment, in a difficult environment. And in this difficult environment, sometimes you have put, to put money on the table to be able to run the system normally. So this is just me and I'm very short, but I think the discussion will be interesting between our uh, four position. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic. I mean, you brought up the same issue as, as a couple of our other speakers, uh, this idea of, of uh, civil and military cooperation. We don't have enough of it in Europe yet. Some countries are doing a better job of this inside their own borders than others, but it's not being coordinated the way it should um, across the EU yet. Uh, but we can come back to that. Uh, our fourth uh, speaker, and then we'll move over to Q&A and or interaction among all of us here. Uh, is Richard Spearman of Vodafone. Richard, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is it's very nice to be here and very nice to be on the panel. And I think, uh, you know, we, there's been some talk already about the need for the closer partnership between the critical infrastructures and governments. And I very much see these sorts of conversations as helping that, uh, that relationship to develop. Uh, I, I agree with many of the points that Jamie and, and, uh, and, and all of you have raised. Space is less my dimension, as you say, it's, it's from outer space to, to on the ground. But I think we are seeing a real shift in how national infrastructure is both perceived and also the level at which we need to both integrate with government in terms of understanding each other's positions and others, each other's roles and, and deliver for one another. And so for me, uh, and there is an international dimension, which I will come to at the end. So for me, I think what we've got is a, a in, in our sector, and I see myself as representing the, 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 the critical infrastructure as a whole, but just using the telcos as an exemplar because it's where I sit rather than being uniquely uh, about my industry, as it were. But it's very clear that governments have, have uh, increasingly come to realize just how important this sector is to the way in which the economy and, and, and civil life runs and that COVID has really accelerated that. So even in the last six months, I think there's been a real sharpening of the focus on, so how is this delivered? How much assurance do I need from you as an industrial provider of it to be confident that I can meet my national obligations in terms of protecting my society? And what are you doing? Are you good enough and what more could you do? And what more do I need to do in the government's shoes to actually bring it to a place where we can feel more confident about it? 
And if you look at the scale of the shifts that we've delivered the sector as a whole, this isn't about a Vodafone, this is about the whole sector has delivered over the last six months, it's extraordinary. Remote working, schooling from home, the entertainment of, of, of populations that are locked down, the ability for those populations to communicate with people they can't see anymore, all of those sorts of things have really underpinned and really stressed in a way the telco sector in terms of having to change the services we deliver, the volumes that we have to provide, the nature and timing at which those services are provided. So we have to be a very dynamic in our response to how it is that society now needs us to, to operate in a position when, when it's in, under real stress from the pandemic. And I think what I would argue for, because so much of what I would have said has already been touched on, but what I would argue key to this is about partnership with governments. And I think we, we, we all talk, I mean, national infrastructure is, is regulated and corralled in various ways uh, you know, with governments. I think those, the nature of those partnerships need to change and, and to deepen. And one of the things I really think is important is that we need to be more literate about each other's um, considerations and also work out where the lines are. So I don't want to get involved in national security conversations in terms of making those decisions about what is and isn't an international risk to my government. What I do want to know is what are you going to do as a consequence of that that might affect the way in which I deliver my network, whether it's through a supply chain issue or some in some other request for further resilience, if you like. And so there's something here about we need to spend more time with each other in a deeper relationship. And we need to think through more carefully, I think, the second order consequences of actually um, of, of policy decisions that are taken, giving timescales and resources and sometimes government financial resources in order to make sure that we can provide the resilient service while making changes that governments are mandating. I think that's a really important principle. On the other, coming to, to Steve's presentation on, on norms, norms are sort of unfashionable, seem you know, terribly difficult to do. And, and when you talk to folk, people get very frustrated quite quickly. But I, I agree with you, Steve. I don't think there's any alternative in some of these areas. So in cyber, which we're particularly interested in because of the, the, the nature of business, we really do need to redouble our efforts on establishing norms. We really do need to redouble our efforts on having um, uh, you know, closer collaboration, both in terms of response, but also in terms of law enforcement to up the price of non-state actor uh, activity against our networks. Um, and we need and we can only do some of these things with the help from government who does have access to intelligence and levers that we don't have to pull as an industry, which we need them to pull on our behalf. So I think there's tremendous scope for greater collaboration. And I think indeed it's essential. And I think we need to have those partnerships and clearly international co cooperation, the further that can get, the easier it gets to deal with issues around national sovereignty, national resilience. Yeah, and, and, and national concerns about um, about uh, sort of autonomy. Because um, uh, if, the, if the superstructure's um, shaking, which it is a bit at the moment, if you look at sort of US-China relations and other things, then that really quickly, as we've seen with, with supply chain, triggers down into national conversations and individual industry conversations in, in ways that can be very, very disruptive. So closer partnership, working together, working on those, not, not giving up on those norms, indeed redoubling our efforts on it, I think are really, really important in order to provide the stability that industry needs in order to make those investment decisions, attract the, attract the investment that we require to deliver the uplift that we certainly want to see in our sector through 5G and other things, to, to, to fund all of that in order to enable the economic recovery that comes post-COVID. I'll stop there. There's plenty more I could say, but look forward to the conversation, Brooks. Thank you very much, and thank you, thank you all for uh, sticking to more or less the time limits. That gives us plenty of time now for Q and A and for discussion. I want to come back to the main um, adjective in the title of this panel, and that is international. Um, what I don't, what I haven't heard, or what I still am unsure about when I listen to your, all of your comments, uh, is what does the international community do, and can it do it in a binding way? And maybe that's too naive. Um, for instance, coming back to Stephen, your comments, um, indeed, space debris, the militarization of space, all the things we worry about, there have been multiple attempts to get treaties going. Uh, there are treaties, but they don't directly deal, if, to my knowledge, with space debris, for instance, or militarization. You could say the same thing about protection of the seabeds, telco units, a telco um, internets, telco networks internationally. What do we do? Are we, I, this is a question for all of you, but I'll start with you, Stephen. 
what are the chances of getting treaties, anything binding? Are, are we really looking only at loose norms or negative actions such as sanctions and disincentives to get this going, to get the community to move in the same direction? Yeah, thanks, Brooks. So the first point on there is there is certainly this existing treaty, the Outer Space Treaty, which does have a core norm that I cited that can be looked to and pointed to by and sort of encourage states to come to some kind of agreement on how should they, the states parties that are already part of that treaty, how should they view what it means to respect the rights and considerations of other states. Um, the uh, codes of conduct uh, the is Surely, yes. Well, it, no, well, not that well, that's voluntary. I mean, yes, there's no way to enforce it, but, but it is an international, it has the standing of international law, the Outer Space Treaty, and, and so the states that have signed it. Um, the, on the other side is the, there is uh, certainly an effort to revive efforts at, at a code of conduct. I know that the, uh, the British government is looking at some ideas to go forward in the UN uh, Committee on Disarmament uh, in, in the coming, uh, coming months. The, EU code of conduct uh, that I mentioned uh, had made great progress amongst the most of the Western Orient space fired states. The, uh, the Russians and the Chinese have been pushing this other idea, which uh, most of the West finds unverifiable, which is banning uh, the pl placement of weapons in outer space, which is not the main concern. In fact, the main concern for most in the U.S. had been some of these direct uh, launches against space assets from the ground. But if the, uh, if the uh, international community were willing to get back in serious, I think another round of discussions on the code of conduct, beginning perhaps with the space debris, you know, some kind of agreement on space debris, that's one that is really in everyone's interest. Because even, even if you have some malign intent, uh, even the op and, and using, say, orbital systems, even the, some of those malign systems would be thre potentially threatened by, uh, by space debris. So that's one where, you know, it's, it's simply in everyone's interest to avoid having lots of space junk that you know, could begin first by uh, threatening the International Space Station, but not to mention all the other uh, costly uh, systems that are out there orbiting. Um, and then, you know, some other, perhaps an operational, uh, you could have some other, you know, efforts to improve the Outer Space Treaty, looking at a, um, a, a one of my former colleagues that Jamie knows well from, uh, from NATO days, um, Paul Meyer, Canadian, put forward some ideas about perhaps you could look at an optional protocol to the Outer Space Treaty on banning weapons of mass destruction in all forms um, in outer space. Uh, so uh, that would be another uh, potential. And then, you know, finally, a ban on destructive ASATs. That would be uh, that would be something that, um, you know, because that also is, uh, is something that, that creates this great risk of, of, of increased debris. Jamie, um you worked on this at NATO for a long time, leaving aside space, um, GovMil, uh, CivMil cooperation, trying to get protection of, of uh, critical infrastructure networks going. Um, I have the impression that it hasn't moved forward as quickly as it should. Also, um, NATO, it's really out of NATO's hands. It depends on, as you said, more with the EU. Um, what does NATO do? I mean, are we looking at a return of sort of Cold War style hardened CI networks that are dedicated only to NATO or is continuing cooperation with the civil sector the answer? Well, yeah, I mean, Brooks, you know, there isn't really a security challenge that you can face today purely with military means alone. I mean, you, you and I remember very well uh, from the days when we used to talk about NATO business when I was there, that if you look at most things that NATO has been doing, you know, sooner or later, it's had to realize that the military element provides only a partial solution or no solution at all. For example, uh, when I was at NATO, I dealt for many years with the problem of improvised explosive devices in Afghanistan and roadside bombs. And for years, we were spending billions, literally billions of dollars across the alliance on things like armor for the troops, better vehicles, uh, helicopter evacuation, better medical treatment, jammers, uh, and still these roadside bombs were coming back into the ground as fast as we could find them and remove them. And eventually we wised up and we realized, and we recognized, as the military say, that we had to go left of the bank and right of the bank, you know, working with the police, the intelligence services, the private sector, the legal authorities, the scientific community on biometrics to build a network, which allowed you, first of all, to identify who was behind this, where the money was coming from, the supply chains, the the ways in which uh, these uh, bombs were smuggled into Afghanistan. And we didn't 
it, we didn't manage to solve the problem entirely, but we certainly dried up a lot of the supply much more cheaply through these international networks of cooperation. Because you know, you often when you start talking to other people, identify a much better way uh, to to deal with the problem. I mentioned the insurance uh, issue, uh, but you know, freezing the assets of of, of, of these uh, organisations, working with the private sector to have a better system of checking uh, who was buying ammonium nitrate potassium chloride. I can give many kind of examples of this, but I think the thing is, is that it often tends to be issue specific. And when NATO leaves Afghanistan, or when there's no longer a pirate in the Gulf of Aden, all of those relationships and the people behind them sort of disperse and go off in their various directions. And then you have to start doing it all again, as NATO is now doing, of course, with the issue of military mobility and access to infrastructure across uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe. In other words, it's too much dependent upon personalities and too little institutionalized. Um, and, and therefore, I think the lesson that NATO has to learn, uh, and it started this by inviting a couple of months ago directors of Homeland Security to start meeting at NATO. The lesson that NATO has to learn is it has to have a much broader outreach into governments. You know, dealing simply, as NATO has done for many years, with foreign and defense ministries and not dealing with overseas development, not dealing with interior ministries, you know, not dealing not, uh, with the intelligence agencies, uh, it doesn't help you to have the kind of connectivity you need to deal with these problems. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, yeah, well, you put your finger on it there, NATO uh, bringing in uh, ministers beyond just defense and affairs, although I'm not sure all the, uh, the member states support that. Uh, Dominic, over to you. Um, I had a question just if you put on your former military hat, and that is, um, one of the one aspect of, of critical infrastructure protection is protecting that of the military. I'm thinking of uh, the electronic weapon, you know, the, the electronic and digital networks that control weapon systems, protect them against electromagnetic pulse, things of this nature. Right now, this is being done strictly by within the boundaries of each member state of the EU, for instance, and NATO, for that matter. Uh, there's no coordination. There are no standards. Um, do you think this is something that the the EU militaries, for instance, need to tackle together. Uh, it could be expensive to do. Could there be some EU money for that? Even though the, the European Defense Fund and other areas have been slashed, still, um, what's the situation? What do you think the, the answer is there? Uh, I, I, I think you're right. The, the switch between the NATO program and the NATO focus uh, before the 90s and still then, and uh, the switch to some sort of EU uh, taking into account this, this sort of subject is really a subject. I mean, in cyber, for example, you've got at the same time NATO working with a, com a small company from the NATO Excellence Center for Cyber in uh, Lithuania and the uh, EU putting forward Lithuania as the, the master in, uh, in cyber. But where are they working together on the same subject and exactly on the same way to protect our defense uh, system is, is still a question for me. I mean, there is still this competition, which I think is useless between NATO and EU. I mean, a lot of uh, NATO countries are in fact part of EU, uh, Western Europe not, is, is not exactly US, and so something must be different, of course, but it's complementary. Uh, and we, we need to work together and to see where EU will work on the subject, put money on the subject, and where NATO is able to do the subject because uh, the, the system is different. So I think coordination between EU and NATO is of major importance to see, not to not to have twice the same efforts, but at least to have one effort on each in, on each uh, subject. Well, they are trying to do that, but um, they have this laundry list of 74 areas of cooperation, which Jamie knows far better than I. But um, and it's it's produced some results in certain areas, such as cybersecurity. But I don't. A lot of it seems a bit fluffy to me as well. But maybe Jamie will scream at me for that. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask um, Richard a question to you. Um, first of all, what do you think about the EU's NIS directive? I mean, is it is it doing enough to ensure pan-European network protection? And I wonder, uh, this might seem like a simplistic question, but it's probably one that's on everyone's mind. Do you see any 
critical infrastructure protection problems lying ahead in terms of coordinating across the channel after Brexit for your sector? The, yeah, to take the first one. I mean, I think I think we're all, the, the 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 NIST is 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 uh, a really good start, um, and I think that some of the things that have happened recently, perhaps accelerated by the problems with the supply chain in the cyberspace in the cyber area, have also you know, the EU toolbox, a single EU position on the risk factors surrounding the new technology of five G. I and mean, that's a I, you know I, I I wouldn't necessarily have expected to have that to have gone as smoothly as it did. I think the interesting thing is that so the EU's got an incredibly important role in trying to to coordinate and pull that together because from a, an industry point of view, the more coordinated it is, the more possible a, you know a, a digital single market is because ultimately what you've got here and one of our fundamental um, uh, challenges is that uh, we we all agree that we want to have it secured, but when you get a national security judgment coming on top. Of of, uh, of, a, of an EU directive and and or or a decision by nation states to go further than the EU is proposing, etc. You end up with different standards of different markets for operators like us who are working across you know borders. Uh, it becomes more complicated. So the more that we can come up with consolidated risk assessments, consolidated toolboxes, and as much as possible have a consolidated imp you know, implementation, accepting that governments will, of course, for national reasons, reserve the right to do some things differently. I think if we start with that sort of continuum, we're less likely to get bogged down and get caught up in 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in extra expense and complexity of doing things differently in in many uh, in, in many different environments. Um, we've already got we've got because we've also got to remember we've got other challenges coming in here which are pushing in a national direction. So I'm quite worried about. Um, what some writers call now data nationalism. Um, so if you're thinking about you know, seamless exploitation of AI for you know, the advancement of the economy and the industrial um, base, etc., and yet you're not allowed to move your data from one country to another, that, that's just not going to work. So coming up with ways to, to, to answer the questions by judgments and others is going to be really, really important to the future of the, the digital single market and the economies going forward. On, on um, uh, the UK's exit, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that um, I have to declare an interest here. For 27 years, I was part of the UK's uh, Foreign Office before joining Vodafone. So I spent many, many years uh, building relationships and spending a lot of time with, with European colleagues. Um, you know, and uh, leaving my personal politics aside on this, my own view is, and I'm hopeful that this is the case, that everyone recognises that security is a, a collective business and best done together. We've worked beyond the EU before, we, and, and I know many EU colleagues work with other countries which are not inside the EU because their interests and the interests of that country go right, and we all have similar interests on some of the greatest threats. And so my you know, profound belief and sincere hope is that um, obviously what's going to go on between now and December is going to be heated pop with quite a lot of grandstanding, um, and there's still lots to play for, so I'm not expecting what I hear over the next month to necessarily be representative of what happens afterwards. Um, and as a former practitioner, what I'm I'm believing to be the case, and as, as, a, as a proud British citizen, I'm hoping will be the case, is that we will continue to, where we can, contribute to um, the the collective effort of, of Europe um, uh, within the EU and beyond to to defending and protecting and ensuring the best possible outcomes against some of these challenges that are genuinely universal. Thank you very much. Um, we do have, uh, we're running out of time here very quickly, but we do have a question coming in about uh, the earlier discussion on space. Let me see what it is. Um, it says, how do you assess the impact of the Starlink, the Elon Musk uh, project um, for the international community? And how do you think, I guess this is for everyone, but probably primarily for uh, Steve, how do you think um, this will will interna interaction with non-state actors in the international community develop. Thanks. I can address that quickly. The uh, well, uh, first of all, Starlink is an example of another of of, of the number of uh, just one among a number of uh, growing ac activities in space by the commercial sector. So it, it's part of the whole question I mentioned about space becoming more active and crowded as a result of a number of other um, actors. 
So on the inter the development of that uh, of the interaction between these non you know which is uh, you know Elon Musk is a Starlink is another non-state actor. There's one web. There's a lot, number of others that are talking to these very large constellation of micro satellites. Um, I, I think that what we see is and and I could tie this back to a point Richard made. Uh, this issue of public-private partnerships. So right now, the United States Air Force provides to the international to the international community its catalog of space objects, um, and uh, it's trying to now transfer uh, that, or at least the the uh, uh, Trump administration has proposed to give the U.S. Department of Commerce, the Office of Space Commerce, the authority to help to provide a linkage to the various commercial operators on that space catalog, so that everyone could have better what's called space situation awareness to know where all these other objects are. Now, it's, it's not that they can't access the, and this data, as they say, is provided by the Air Force, the so-called space uh, catalog, uh, but it could be done more systematically. And then you could also um, have a further a development of norms, uh, and this would require uh, more international cooperation uh, on the uh, actual orbital slots, you know, where are some of these future satellites going to be parked. And again, you know, it's it's kind of remarkable. I can't. It's hard to, hard to imagine. You know, having grown up in the Sputnik era, but of, you know, one little ball up there. But they're talking literally about you know hundreds of clusters of these uh, micro satellites about the size of a of a toaster, uh, you know, operating and, and sending back signals. So so it's a very complex, condensed uh, uh, operating environment that does warrant uh, this greater intent. And, and, the, and the industry is, is asking for this. I mean, they, as I said, are, are starting to move out on their own to try to set up some norms so that they don't lose uh, expensive investments. I took a trip yesterday to um, its site west of Brussels, uh, its new site on uh, satellite transmission. And one of the issues that came up is the expected thousands and thousands of toaster-sized swarms of, of low-flying orbit, uh, low, low orbit satellites, which are going to be flying around very soon. Some are already up there and what to do about the debris and how to track it and how to use it and how to regulate it. So but that's that's subject for another panel debate, I think. Um, that brings us to the end. Uh, we're coming up very fast on three o'clock um, Bucharest time. So I do want to thank all of our panelists uh, for very good intervention, some heavy topics that you've addressed, also some very um, solid ideas. Um, I'm not sure that um, these things are all going to materialize the way we want them to, but we can keep our fingers crossed and hope they do. Anyway, for that, uh, I want to thank the organizers and thank all of our viewers for tuning in. And we will uh, close now in order for the next session uh, of the Bucharest Forum to begin. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brooks.